Welcome to the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing Podcast. In this episode, another update on proposed new cost sharing rules. The UK CAA is planning to restrict the advertising of cost sharing flights, despite the vast majority of us objecting to the plan. It looks like it will become mandatory for most of us to carry an active carbon monoxide detector in our aeroplanes in future. Details coming up. And could the UK's flight information services and lower airspace radar services be getting a much needed overhaul? That's all to come in this episode. Well, welcome along and we'll get straight to it with an update on the UK CAA's intention to change the rules around cost sharing flights. This has been going on for some time now, but there has been an update. Cost sharing flights are currently legal in the UK. Flights can be advertised, but the pilot can't profit from the trips. Our regulator has been looking at ways to tighten up the rules because it's worried that cost sharing is being used to hide grey or illegal charters. It's already announced that it's planning to make the following changes. It wants to make it compulsory for pilots to obtain passenger declaration forms from their cost sharing passengers and a requirement for pilots to keep those forms for six months. It will be mandatory to inform passengers about the differences between a private flight on a private aeroplane compared with a commercial air transport flight. The CAA also wants to change the rules so that pilots and passengers have to pay an equal share of the direct cost of the flight. At the moment in the UK, the pilot just has to pay something towards the flight, but it could be as little as a pound. The CAA had yet to announce changes on the advertising of cost sharing flights, but this last week or so they've revealed their plan. This follows a consultation with pilots and stakeholders. Now, despite the consultation receiving more than 1800 responses, with the overwhelming majority against any changes to the advertising rules, the CAA has decided to press ahead anyway with the new restrictions, albeit with a slightly watered down proposal. The CAA says that it proposes to still allow advertising of cost sharing flights, but with the following new conditions. The advert must be placed by the pilot intending to operate the flight. The advert must include the start and end locations, include the date when the pilot is available to conduct the flight and any other information directed by the regulator. That other information, might the way, by the way, might mean that pilots have to declare the license or ratings they hold, their medical status, the number of hours they've flown in total and how recent they are. So it's a very subtle change from what they had been proposing. They've now removed the requirement for the flight to be a specific flight that was going ahead anyway, regardless of whether passengers were available or not. The CAA says that it's made that amendment so that pilots will be allowed, it, allowed some flexibility, for example, to change the destination if the weather turns ugly. Now, just thinking here as your average private pilot, not particularly conversant in the nuances in the language of aviation law, I have to say I find the new position and the language pretty confusing. To help with that, though, the CAA says that it's going to issue additional guidance. But ultimately, what they're trying to do here is prevent pilots advertising their availability to fly anyone, anywhere, at any time. In other words, they call it holding themselves out like a, a legal charter. And I just think if that's their aim, there must be a better and more clearer way of putting that in the rules. But the final wording isn't yet done. The rules will have to be drawn up by some experts at the Department for Transport and put into regulation. So there's going to be some tweaking, I would have thought. As it stands, though, I think your average pilot is going to find this quite hard to understand at the moment. Next, will it become mandatory to fit active carbon monoxide detectors in our aeroplanes? But first, the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing is sponsored by the Flyer Watch Company. Flyer is a range of aviation-inspired watches that not only look great, but every one sold helps dreams take flight. With exception to their charity watch, 20% of the profits from their watches fund PPL scholarships administered by, for example, the Honourable Company of Air Pilots and the Air League. Now, for those of you watching this episode on video, you can see that I have the Swiss-made Horizon watch, which features a Swiss 
chronograph movement, water resistance up to 100 meters, and the ability to change the strap when you feel like a change. All the watches come with a 14-day return policy, a two-year warranty, and free worldwide delivery. Check out their ranges at flyerwatches.com. So there are strong indications that the UK CAA is looking at making it mandatory for active carbon monoxide detectors to be carried in most piston engine aeroplanes that have non-pilot passengers on board. Carbon monoxide poisoning has been cited as a causal factor in a number of GA accidents around the world. One of those accidents involved the footballer Emiliano Sala, who died in a crash in the English Channel near Guernsey in 2019. The official report into the accident recommended the use of active carbon monoxide detectors in piston engine aircraft. And since then, the CAA has been raising awareness of the issue and seeking our views. And it's not stopping. It's just launched a new consultation looking at the challenges that pilots and owners face in putting detectors in their aeroplanes, whether they should be mandatory and whether checks for carbon monoxide concentration should be mandatory as a maintenance task. At the moment, some aircraft are not required to have this check performed when undergoing maintenance. It depends what kind of maintenance program you're operating under. From the consultation, it does very much look as if the CAA wants to make it mandatory for active detectors to be present in all piston engine aircraft when carrying non-pilot passengers, with the exception of single seat aircraft and open cockpit aircraft. But contrary to some fears, it does appear as if the CAA will allow the use of these domestic off-the-shelf detectors in addition to aviation standard equipment, so the cost burden shouldn't be too high. Personally, I think one of the biggest issues with these domestic detectors is where to put them. Um, I've seen them floating about cockpits, you know, in the you know little pockets. <laughs> Not ideal, is it? We don't have a lot of room in our uh, little single-engine piston aeroplanes. I actually recently put one in my Arrow. It's pretty small, uh, one of the smallest um, I could find sort of domestically. Um, the brand is Wolf Shield. I got it from a very well-known online shop company. Um, I'm not endorsing it, by the way. That I've got no association with that, the company that makes this. I don't know how good it is. It's just one maybe to look at if space is at a premium. It says it's good for use in the home, camper van, car, boats, and more. There are other products already out there, of course, that are pretty useful too. Headsets and cigarette lighters with detectors built in. And of course, you can even get certified or you know the official aviation style equipment as well. The CAA's carbon monoxide proposals are part of a consultation that's just started. If you want to respond to that and read a bit more about it, what they're looking to do, and maybe you can share with them experiences that you've had using the detectors, look up CAP 2975. CAP 2975. Astral Aviation Consulting helps me put this monthly briefing together. Astral runs workshops and provides GA safety resources on behalf of the UK CAA. Astral has a free workshop coming up, which you might be interested in. It's on the 20th of March at 7.30 in the evening British time, and it's on practice forced landings. Join Chris, Matt and Nigel to explore the nuances of practice forced landings, how to handle them, what examiners look for on tests, and to get some top tips from the team. Check out the Astral Aviation Consulting website to register for the free workshop. Finally, for today, if you've flown in Europe, you'll know how easy it can be and how helpful and useful the flight information services are. Yes, we do have a really helpful and always cheerful flight information service over here on London and Scottish information, but it's, I'm being, trying to be fair here, it's not very well connected and it really does have limitations. Our lower airspace radar services in the UK are a bit patchy too, especially at weekends. Over in Europe, they don't have things like the basic service or a traffic service, and on the whole, they seem far better at seamlessly passing you on from sector to sector and even helping you with clearances through controlled airspace. So you don't have to leave the flight information frequency to go through class D, for example. Here in the UK, getting through controlled airspace is quite a rigmarole, isn't it? Lots of radio telephony, lots of readbacks. Contrast that with Europe. Often, I'd call up and ask for some 
a transit of Class D and they'll simply just say, approved, in a very cheery French accent. Many of us familiar with the European Flight Information Service have long wanted a more joined up system like that. Here in the UK it would be great, wouldn't it, with better funded lower airspace radar service, full 24-7 provision and easier or, or much smoother access to controlled airspace. Well, you might be pleased to know that this is all part of the plan in the airspace modernisation strategy that's looking at how we might do things between now and the year 2040. Gosh, 2040, hopefully it won't take them quite that long to make the improvements because I will never see them in my flying time, I'm sure. As part of this work, the CAA wants your input so it can come up with plans to replace our current UK flight information services. services with a service more closely aligned with ICAO standards. To be honest, the call for input that they've published at the moment doesn't give us much more to go on. Uh, you could get a bit more detail from the uh, airspace modernization, modernization strategy. That gives, them, gives you a bit more of an intent of what they're trying to do. The call for input that they've just asked, put out at the moment basically is asking us what we think of the current service, what should be done to improve it, and whether they should digitise it using things like FISB and TISB technologies. The call for input also asks you what you think about the current LARS provision. Mm, patchy at best. Does it, meet your, does it meet your needs? Should ATZs be replaced by radio mandatory zones and transponder mandatory zones? And what shapes should those zones be? What is missing from this whole debate at the moment is cost. How would all of this be paid for? For example, fully integrated 24-7 radar service. It's going to be very expensive, right? How's that going to be funded? And how it's going to be funded is not in the strategy or in this consultation document. That said, I think it's definitely worth you responding to this call for input. Let them know how you feel. I'm sure we can all agree that the system needs improving. Why not let the CAA know your views, what improvements could be made. The consultation is open until the 29th of March. Well, that completes this pilot briefing podcast. The next episode comes out at the same time next month. Thank you for following along. Be sure to subscribe to the Flying Reporter Pilot Briefing Room YouTube channel or follow the podcast for the next in the series. Until then, fly safely, my friends. Bye for now.